Welcome back folks to Two Brits One Puck. I'm your host, Mr Intangibles, a bin boy and an opera boy, Dan Masters, with my good friend, the East Kent Elliot Friedman, and a man who once went on a tour through Eastern Europe. Will Everett Human, Will, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you, Dan, very well. Good to be back. A ton of news this week, and I feel like we could do a whole show on the two things we're about to talk about right now. <coughs> but um, we did mention last week we are going to talk about a couple of Netflix things <clears throat> this week. Don't worry, we'll get to hockey, but we just had to mention these two things. Will, The Witcher and Don't Fuck With Cats. Your thoughts? Would you, would you want to do first? Do you want to do The Witcher or, or The we'll Cats? We'll go Witcher then? first. We'll go Witcher first. Okay. We've got about two and a half minutes for each one, so... <laughs> okay, there's a quick point, right? If you've, you've played The Witcher 3, haven't you? Indeed. There you go. I, yeah, I thought it was good. I thought... Um, yeah, like it's a bit confusing and you get to the end and it does feel a bit like, oh, okay, it's all setting up for series two or whatever, but it was enjoyable along the way sort of thing. The thing the thing my wife and I were saying was, so obviously you've got Geralt, Yennefer and Ciri are like the main characters, that you're the main protagonists that you're following. Yeah. But it felt like all of the secondary characters, like there were so many of them, that you didn't really so like say the end of the series that big set piece you don't necessarily have the same I didn't know who anyone I could barely remember anyone's name didn't really have that much invested in them because there were so many of them yeah that's a good point and they're all sort of on the same sort of level so there's no apart from like Yaskir and uh, and the little elf kid there's like no sidekicks no no tears of who I should really care about and who's just there for cannon fodder you know what I mean yeah, I felt it would have been, if they could have squeezed out another two or three episodes, it would have been better, just to flesh out some of those secondary characters a bit more. Yeah, definitely. Um, but it, it was still a good good series as a whole lot. Yes, some of those I, fun- really, I really enjoyed it. Like, video game adaptations are usually complete dross, and it wasn't, and I was very happy with that. And Henry Cavill is an amazing as Geralt. Jesus Christ. Um, just perfect, just perfect. He is the king of the nerds. He petitioned for that role. He's a video games player. He loves The Witcher. And he wanted that role desperately, so I can credit him, the king of the nerds. Did it justice? They had the um, the geezer who played the Night King and the uh, the stunt coordinator for Game of Thrones do the do the uh, the stunt coordination for The Witcher as well. And Jesus oh, I Christ, didn't know. yeah, the, those like those sword <coughs> fight, that first sword fight was unbelievable. Just absolutely mental in the little well, the butcher of what's it called? What was that yeah, first place? Yeah, C- case in point, you just can't. Can't, yeah. Don't remember anyway. Like, don't remember anyway. Don't remember any finer details. But yeah, first episode has an incredible sword fight sequence, and it's just really cool. Really, really cool. Just a fun little journey. And yes, I was. I was also very confused, especially in episode four, when there was a wedding, and I was looking at people thinking, "Hang on a minute, you weren't here a minute ago. Where have you come from? I'm not sure what's going on." But then once I realised what they were doing, I was like, "Oh, okay, now I get it." And then it was kind of like a video game, because there were certain points where. Geralt would kind of look like he'd been killed. It would fade to black, like a video game would. And I thought, that's kind of a clever trope. And then, like, somebody kind of, you know, magically revives him or brings him back. And I thought, I like that. That was really clever. And I thought it was good the way they kept it in it. But yeah, just a couple of extra episodes would have done, I think. But yeah, definitely. I think maybe as well, it was a it was a big risk doing the show, wasn't it? And it probably cost a lot of money to make. So now they've done, like, and everyone raved about it. So now they've done what they've done, they're probably going to bust out, like, 12 or 13 episodes for season two. It'll be interesting to see what they do with season two as to how much interaction there's going to be between the three main characters and stuff like that. Because it's yeah. quite, a, quite a weird way of doing, you know, you don't often have one where the screen time is split so evenly between these characters. Having yeah, that's a good point. Especially, you know, they're having different adventures and there's weird stuff happening with the timeline and stuff. So There's not going to be a season two of Don't Fuck With Cats, obviously. But well, you, you never know. <laughs> you never know, to be fair. Right. Christ. How do you get how do you get through this in about three minutes? I'll put the ball in your court, Will. Uh, what did you think? But uh, just just to first say, because it's still fairly new, like obviously there's gonna be a bit of spoilers in the next three minutes or so. So if you don't wanna hear them skip, you know, you know, the sort of shit. Here's your final warning. Yeah, it was really fucking good. We absolutely smashed through it in we did it, just did it in Fuck two it. days, two episodes, one night and then finished it off the next night. Um Fucking yeah. insane. Yeah, it's it's crazy. It's crazy how like it's just a really interesting story about sort of true crime in the modern age. Because you know, all these true crime series, you know, like the keepers. Oh, what was the fucking the one? confession killer? I watched over Christmas as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, abducted in plain sight. That's all from sort of like the seventies, eighties, and nineties. So it's a bit yeah pre yeah. 
to have one like this where people are on top of the details as they're happening and like these people who are hunting the killer are like ahead of the police in their you know in the information they have and stuff and they're not being believed in that sense it's yeah really interesting and compelling series. yeah just by using things like ebay and google maps and stuff like that they're finding things out before the police or you know trying to lead the police <clears throat> down the right path and stuff like that and it's, it's a really interesting case study in like not only sort of the tenacity of the the internet at large but also the different techniques that you can employ to in an investigation in this day and age yeah because i'd imagine that a lot of the things that people were doing that group were doing to try and find the killer it's not normal police work really is it from my understanding no not no not at all so yeah really really interesting story and a really interesting character luca magnotta like the whole luca magnotta is Yes, a very interesting character. When when he starts to introduce uh, the idea of Manny at the end, <laughs> I I believed him. I believed him. I did, too. I did too. I and did Gra- too. Grace is just sitting there saying no, as if, as if. And I think part of me was like, for the story, it'd be so good if this Manny guy existed. But then maybe that's yeah. a sequel. <laughs> yeah, the story of Manny. Whose hands? Story of Manny. Down? Whose hands were they it, on the snake? I know. Um, I know. I bet it was right up your street with your uh, your obsession with serial killers and all that, dude. It was like it was it was like Netflix made a show just for me. I could not. I watched all three in one night, and it was it was a work night, and I went to bed at like half past two. I could not. I just could totally, not. Totally I was like, it. doesn't? Oh yeah, I have to keep totally watching it. I have to keep watching it. It was unbelievable. I will say that they kind of glossed over the fact that that kind of biker group who looked after animals made a guy kill himself. That was just kind of brushed under the carpet kind of thing i mean they oh, mentioned it mate, I... but there was nothing else like you made a guy kill himself with online bullying like what the hell i don't yeah i i barely read it that i barely took that in exactly was it exactly it was to, it was to do with the luke maniota case wasn't it oh yeah, yeah, yeah some yeah, guy yeah. pretended was, to be exactly some guy set up a him. fake yeah, some guy fe- set up a fake Facebook account <sighs> pretending to be Luke and Magnotta and everyone bombarded him like, kill yourself, you're a piece of shit, you're a piece of shit. And it turned out the guy had like severe mental problems and was just trying to get attention for himself. <clears throat> but he ended up killing himself because of all these people on this Facebook group saying, thing, you know, like just horrible things to him. And it was yes. just kind of <laughs> like a five minute segment. I was like, what? That's not interesting though. That's not, that's not Luke and Magnotta, mate. Fuck yeah! I and it was a good, it was a good case study into celebrity and the cult of celebrity, and just wanting to be famous for something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing anything you can to be famous. Yeah, just doing something, doing anything you can to be famous, and the fact that you think you're different to everyone else on the planet, like trying to lead people on chases. I mean, he did literally across the world. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a good case study in how to successfully do it. Oh yeah. I was telling someone at work, and I was like, well, so he was in Paris, right? And she went, right, yeah. And then I was just blah, 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 blah. Okay, and then he's in Berlin. And she went, hang on, what? I thought he was in Paris. I was like, no, no, he was in Paris. Now he's in Berlin. And she was like, hang on a minute. I thought he was in Toronto before. I was like, no, no, no. He was in, like, Montreal. What? So <laughs> like, he was, yeah, he was born fucking... in Toronto. Then he moved to yeah. Montreal. <laughs> yeah. It's fucking mad. Absolutely fucking mental. One thing I really hated about that documentary, though, was that bit right at the end, the last, last little shot or a couple of shots where they try and use this whole situation as get off social media, put your phone down, turn your laptop off or whatever. It's like, oh, for fuck's sake, come on. Don't, no, don't be doing that body moving. Don't try and twist this into a, an anti-technology moral of the story. <laughs> she kind of had a point though, but I kind of see what she was saying. Did they, because they gave him what he wanted, is that why he kept going? If nobody re- reacted to it, would he have gone worse and worse? Or would he have just been like, oh, this is a waste of time. I've, I've fucked up here. Forget it. Yeah, it's hard to say. The, the I exist- guess the way she did it, yeah. The way she did it was a bit, all right, love. You, fucking you calm st- down. You still needed Luca Magnotta to be fucking mental to start with. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> An absolute socio-psychopath. He's, yeah. he's not like just some, ge- not some geezer who like, uploads a vine and then gets loads of likes as well. <laughs> oh, shit, how do I top this? I better kill a cat. <laughs> What do I, go I better go to the pet shop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> one kit and one snake, please. <laughs> Sell hoovers. Oh, never mind. Now it's down the street, mate. Yeah. Oh, mate. So good. I mean, terrible. Absolutely terrible. 
Ah, terrible, but so fabulous. Good. You get, yeah. If you get a chance, people, and The Witch is not your thing, fantasy stuff and all that, <laughs> fair enough, but Don't Fuck With Cats is, pff, yeah, one of the wildest things I've ever seen. Could, could we also just touch on how terrible a name that is? How absolutely oh, diabolical a title oh. that is. <laughs> Don't Fuck With Cats. Don't Fuck With Cats, all right. Do you know what it is as well? I was thinking, there's a lot of people who don't like cats. I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> Some people are thinking, I'm glad he killed those cats. Fuck cats, I hate them. <laughs> Fuck those Do you know what cats. I mean? I mean, I love cats. I'm a cat. I prefer cats to dogs. So yeah, to me, don't fuck with cats. You don't fuck with cats. But if they'd called it, don't fuck with dogs, I guarantee you more people would have watched it. I just, I just think it's a bad title. Just as a title, don't fuck with cats. Like That tells me absolutely nothing. And if anything, it almost put me off of watching it. You know, without a decent review, I wouldn't have taken a chance on it just based on the title. It wasn't wasn't the review because I said watch it because I said to you, mate, it's not what you think. You got to watch it. Yeah, because you because you said it was like a abducted in, in plain sight. sight. It was crazy like that. Which it which it absolutely is. Oh, mate, when it all ties together at the end, and you realise why he's done it all. It's like, oh my god. It was fabulous. What, absolutely what, fabulous. What a genius. <laughs> yeah, I think there's similar themes between. Luca Magnotta and uh, a lot of the stuff that's happened this week. It's a fantastic point. All right, let's have some hockey chat. Let's. everybody it is that time of the week it is of course the smooth recap the tampa bay lightning win 10 straight games and look unbeatable but that run is ended by the mvp trading head coach firing gm changing new jersey devils because hockey makes no fucking sense fans and media alike were bemoaning the lack of intensity in regular season games this week with yet another historic geographical rivalry passing without incident. If only somebody had tried to put the battle back into Battle of Alberta. Brad Marchand has often had a reputation for being dirty, but this season he's turned over a new leaf. He's even gone as far as making sure he provides NHL with comedy gold, as he fucks up tremendously in a shootout against the Flyers, and the whole world chuckles. Prior to this week's run of NHL games, only 11 goalies in league history had been credited with scoring a goal. We've now hit a dirty dozen, so Pekka Rinne, come on down and claim your free 2019 Kia Rio. Ilya Kovalchuk makes his mark for his new team, as he scores an OT winner for the Montreal Canadiens. When he scored the winner, it was listed as goal scored by winger. This might not be surprising when you consider that in their forward core, the Canadians have 12, yes, 12, wingers. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas clearly doesn't apply to Gerard Glant, as the Jack Adams winning coach is told to fuck the fuck off for what alleged GM Kelly McCrimmon describes as basically no reason. At the start of the season, Elvis Musleekins was playing like a hound dog and had a suspicious mind because of the press. But after being goal shook up, his teammates rushed over to say thank you very much, as he recorded his first career NHL shutout, ironically against the town where the King made his name the most. Two Western Conference Canadian teams have unveiled some naughty practice jerseys this week. The Canucks donned red and gold to honour the Chinese Lunar New Year, while the Jets will be wearing indigenous inspired tarps in the near future. Russian machine, Alexander Ovechkin sits alone at number 11 on the all-time goals list, and is only four behind Mario Lemieux in 10th place. I mean seriously, how good can he be if he's only in 10th place all time? Philip Forsberg needs to hop off Andrei Svechnikov's little Andre and find his own way to score. Fucking tea leaf. And that was your smooth recap. Alright, Brad Marchand's penalty shot, thoughts. Fucking beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. <laughs> Wasn't it amazing? I'm so glad. <laughs> like the fact that you clipped it enough as well for it to legally count as an attempt. Like, oh. 
Oh, it was oh. a perfect player to do it. It was a, there's like four or five players it would have been just right for. He's one of them for sure. <laughs> yeah, he's. Oh. Yeah, I don't know. Did, did you see the um, the uh, the tweet that he sent out? The reply to someone who was tripping him. <laughs> yeah, calling guns? him a peasant. <laughs> Some mate, come on, come on. Get yeah, you got to take that one. Unfortunately, you got to take all the. Ch- I mean, to be fair, he'll probably take chirps off everyone else in HR, won't he? But he'll never have it from fans, will he? No, I, just, I mean. Yeah, not to get too uh, too political about it or anything, but you can't. Um, you, uh, another bit of evidence of of just the type of people that uh, most NHL players are, where he's calling someone a peasant because he's officially a millionaire. It's like, come on, mate, <laughs> fucking hell! <laughs> All right, who's winning the cup this week? I don't, there's one man that's going to win the cup this week, Dan, and it's Stephen Johns. Have you heard about Stephen Johns? I did not hear about Stephen Johns. What, what's not this? Heard about Stephen Johns. Do you remember Stephen no. Johns by any chance? I remember. Yeah, yeah, I do. So Stephen Johns, uh, Dallas D man. In March 2018, he got a concussion off a hit from I want to say David Perron, but not that it matters. So he got a concussion out as you are with a concussion. He then suffered from what they're calling post-traumatic headaches and uh, has not played an NHL game since. So it's been 22 months since Stephen Johns played an NHL game. Towards the end of last year, he started practising with the team again, and he uh, he got sent down for an AHL conditioning assignment this past week. In his first game of professional hockey in 22 months, with the Texas Stars in the AHL, he came back with a 4.9 and absolutely dominated. Big ups to you, Stephen. Let's get you back in the NHL ASAP. Fantastic stuff, yeah. Shout out Stephen Johns. Okay, it's uh... beautiful, isn't it? 22 months. I can't imagine 22 that's, months like trying to recover from something. God. And like the sort of thing that's affecting your daily life as well. And to finally get back on yeah. the ice and, and to still have it as well. Because he could have easily gone back and like not been the same player. Yeah, but, good point. Yeah. Cool, mate. So, so happy for him. Great stuff. Okay. Mine is more of a hope than a belief. Go on. But I hope the Winnipeg Jets win the cup. As Paul Maurice had a, a choice quote last week. He was asked about three on three OT after the uh, the excellent overtime against the Leafs. And Maurice said, and I quote, three on three, it's a free-for-all of fecal matter. It's a shit show out there. <laughs> Just brilliant. Poetic. Poetic Paul Maurice. He has a, has a way with words, that uh, that Mr. Maurice, doesn't he? <laughs> he does indeed, he does indeed. All right, who's getting relegated? Uh, the Wild are getting relegated. <laughs> Again, I Any feel other like reason? They've... Or is it just the Wild? Well, while that would you know meet the sort of requirements to be relegated, relegated by just being the Wild, did you hear about what happened in their uh, their game the other night against the Penguins? Oh. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yes, I did. So for for the uninitiated, obviously you've got to fill out a team sheet of who's playing in your in your lineup uh, every night for an AHL game, so that the refs know who's playing legally, who's insured, and all that to play. Etc. Etc. Who's who's going to get paid for the play and shit like that? The Wild failed to write Greg Patteron's name down, so they had to play with five D men. <laughs> Greg Patteron was on the bench. Oh, but he, but he wasn't lit. But okay. he wasn't on the team sheet. So the refs had to on say, the team mate, sheet. Right, you're not, right. Yeah. You're not listed. So <laughs> fuck off. Your name's not down, mate. You're not coming in. <laughs> exactly that. <laughs> exactly that. And how can you? How can we trust any of the paperwork that the Wild have submitted this year now? Are they even it could all le- be tainted. Absolutely. Are they even legally an AHL club? Right. Who's well, to say? I mean, the, the, the jury could still be out on that one. <laughs> we should, they should fold <laughs> immediately. Do you know what? I don't, think you should, I don't think you should have to submit a team sheet. I think every player should always be insured. And then just surprise, just like wrestling, just surprise people when, when the team comes out. I do wonder about longer benches sometimes. That is a, that's always a, a bit of a talking point, isn't it? Yeah. Like they're doing international, <laughs> there's no limit on... How many skaters you can dress, is there? No. I think Fair enough. Like you dress, you know, you just, I don't know, say, say they change the limit to 25 or whatever. You have 25 dress skaters, but you decide you're going to play with, I don't know, well, just 18 forwards. <laughs> yeah. Or just, just see how it works out. Fuck it. We're going, to eight, we're going 18 forwards tonight. Yeah. We're going to, we need we're to go for six lines. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I mean, you still, you still have like, you still have D men, but they're just forwards playing D. Or if you need like you need a point, you need a point to finish off your season, and you just you just go with eighteen D men. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just just nothing but nothing but shutdown. Yeah, you just you just play a five zero system. That's it. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Like um, yeah, like the uh, just play the trap basically. I can see. Yeah, to be fair, you've already had that one with the trap. All right. Who uh, <sighs> who are you relegating? Go on. 
Is it, is it's it one really of my pet peeves. One of my pet peeves this week for getting relegated, and I'm going to single out one person because this was more evident this week. But it's everybody. It's not everybody, but it's a lot of people. I'm going to relegate people not taking a loss when they're wrong. Wyshynski tweeted out after Elvis said, "I'm not talking to the media. I'm focusing on my game. Sorry, I'm just not going to do any media appearances." Greg says, "I predict he's going to go oh five and one then, and still blame the media." He doesn't. Elvis is playing really well. So then Wyshynski has to turn around and say, well, I didn't actually mean he'd go 0-5-1. and 1. What I meant was he's actually, you know, going to handle the media badly or some, some, you know, some convoluted thing. And it's like, dude, just say you got it wrong. Just say, wow, that prediction was rubbish. Or it just, you don't have to backtrack. Why can't anybody just say anymore, damn, I got that wrong, didn't I? It drives me insane. And I see it all the time. Everyone's so scared of like trying to protect their own skin and they just cannot say that they were wrong. And it drives me mad. For, for something as like inane as that, like what? Yeah, if, if like who cares? You made a prediction really... about a goalie. You got it. Everyone got it wrong. And, and, you and like shit. A, a tongue-in-cheek prediction of that. Like who's who's holding yeah. accountable for that? That you have to respond. Like I know. <laughs> what, what's it matter? And if he'd just done that, he'd like every, like seriously. Every time Elvis is winning games now, he's getting like bombarded by messages from like from Blue Jackets fans Fucking saying, Duh. and he just has to keep saying, "Well, I actually meant something else." No, saying a goal is going to go o five and one doesn't mean anything else. It means you think he's going to be shit, and he's not been shit. He's been very much very good. And just say fuck it, I got it wrong. It oh, drives me mad. Well, I'm never going to admit that I'm wrong about anything ever again. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> do you know what? To... Joking aside, it's something I try to make sure that I do on this show. <laughs> and if I'm wrong, if I remember saying something and I'm wrong about it, we did. We absolutely did. Uh, well, after the Blues on the cup, we both said, "Yeah, we got Craig Brubey. We were totally wrong on that. You know, he made us all like he made us all look like fools, and good for him." I was, I was like, I was, "There's nothing wrong with that." I was funnily enough listening back to the 2019 recap today, and specifically my oh. conversation about the Blues, and I stand <laughs> stand by everything I said. Stand by absolutely yeah. every last bit of it. <laughs> okay, uh, how many stars and scratches you got? Uh, I've got a pair of each, two and two. Oh, nice. Okay, I got th- I got a three and a one, so I'll go first then. Uh, I'm going to start Nate Thompson. Shout out to Nate Thompson this week, who he opened up about his alcohol and drug addiction. And as you know, or I don't know if you know, like I know you know, but maybe some listeners don't know, but I have a strong connection with this kind of thing, being a, a former drug and alcohol addict myself in a, in a past life, shall we say. And it's incredibly hard to open up to people about this kind of thing. And it's it seems very it's always the kind of yeah just stop doing it mate and it's but it's crazily it is not that easy because you just think that your life is nothing without these things and then you get into this space of oh, well if I stop doing it like what's the point like what am I going to do and it must have been really hard for him to open up about it so shout out to Nate Thompson very strong of you Nate well done yeah all right what do you got I'm starting a Canadian as well but for uh, for very different reasons Dan I'm going to start Kale Flurry. Did you see the shift <laughs> okay, that this yes, boy had? Yes. In the same shift, he, um, he uh, laid the body, as they say, on uh, Messrs. Milan Lucic and Zach Ronaldo. And it's just beautiful. Two geezers who are supposedly out there to uh, sort of curtail that sort of stuff, you know, intimidate the opposition, especially, you know, rookies like Kale Flory is. Yeah. Now, boys, get the fuck off the ice, you fucking dinosaurs. You don't belong here no more. We'll talk about dinosaurs a bit later, won't we? <laughs> I certainly hope so. I'm gonna. My second starter is. I, I don't know if you've, I'm gonna say this name. I don't know if you've heard of this player, but I'm gonna throw it out there anyway. You may have heard of him. You may have not. Um, I'm gonna start a player called Yaramir Yaga. He's playing in Europe at the moment. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Um, I did once or twice. Once or twice. Yeah, but he became this week only the second pro skater ever to play in five different decades. Which is fucking unbelievable. Absolutely ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. In the game he did it as well, he had, he had a 4 point night. Because obviously, because why wouldn't he? At 47. He's 48. 48? 48, 48 Jesus years old, he had a 4 Christ. point night in a pro hockey game. That's just crazy. It's not ridiculous. Man. And you know what? I, st- I just still get the feeling that you could do a job for somebody on the fourth line. I just get this horrible, like, oh, like wouldn't nobody just bring him back for like a playoff run or something? I don't know, it'd be interesting to see. It, it does kind of feel like his, his story's not finished yet, but... Yeah, it does, it does. I don't know. He's, he's back home with the with the team he owns, and he's getting closer and closer to 50, like... Not from a from a skill and ability standpoint, but more like a... 
social maybe a good four, guy in the room maybe he'd be a good guy in the room oh jeez louise he sure as fuck would be he sure as fuck would be yeah and throw some yager intangibles in there do you do you know the other player is who's played in five different deca- decades then yeah i mean you may have i mean i don't know if you've got any of you listeners have heard of this player as well but a mr a mr gordy howe was the other one young gordy howe gordon yeah howe to uh to those who don't know him. yeah five different decades not bad at all not bad all right what's your next one uh, I'm going to start a Czech player for my second starter, uh, a guy called Jaromir Jager, who's played <laughs> in five different day decades of hockey. <laughs> there you go. Well, there we go. There we go. Yeah, Beautiful. It has to happen now and again. Stars yeah. aligning. And, and if it was going to happen for, for something as monumental as this, I, I, I do think like he's got to be... Not that anything much has really changed apart from the turning of the calendar, but like Jager has got to be up there in the way that people view Gordie Howe. You know what I mean? Yeah, he's got to like, be. It's Jager. He's like Fucking... the ultimate European Iron Man sort of thing, isn't he? Yeah. This is... Okay. My first two were kind of quicker. This, this one's just silly, but I'm starting Diego the Tortoise. Okay? <laughs> Diego now, the Tortoise? Who the fuck? I, I right. assume he's a tortoise of some sort. Diego the... This, yeah, this isn't some... um. What's the word? This isn't some nickname or anything for some really slow player or something. Diego the Tortoise, an actual tortoise, is retiring. All right? Little story here. In 1976, scientists found out that there was a breed of Galapagos tortoises. The, the Latin name is Chelonoides hudensis. Okay? Yeah. There were 14, 14 of these tortoises left on the planet. So they are close to extinction. They're close to being wiped out. There were 12 females and two males. They introduced a third male to the island, the aforementioned Diego, and he slang so much dick that he is credited for producing 800 of the 2,000 new tortoises that live on the island. Diego literally saved the species by slanging awesome dick. This is in all capitals, a man, a man amongst men. Diego, you ledge. So there were there were three male tortoises, yeah, on the island? Yep. And there were 2,000 new tortoises? Yeah. So Diego provided 800 of 40%. the 2,000. Yeah, that's not really that much more than... Like, it's above average, but it's not like he provided like 70% or anything like that. Yeah, but he he's first. The other two are joint third. He's the winner. He's the king of saving species just by numbers alone. Yeah, but it's like, it's like say, you've got three geezers running 100 metres. One, yeah. does, one does 9-4 and the other, do, other two do 9-4-8. You're not going to crown the geezer like, you know, like years ahead of the other two. I mean, I would, because he's the fastest, therefore the best. Yeah, but he's only just the fastest. He's, he's, he's definitely still the fastest, and Diego is definitely the most productive. You see, he's, he's you see, not... in your analogy, those two, they're not... Like, the guy who finishes second isn't second. He's the first <laughs> loser. What you mean? <laughs> yeah, in a race. Yeah, he's the first loser. These two tortoises are the two loser tortoises. They can't keep up with Diego. He's a man amongst men. Who's to say it wasn't just like you know just a good run? Next <laughs> next season, next season Diego next might, season. might regress a bit, and and you know, one of the other geezers goes on goes on a bit of a run, a bit of a tear. Maybe they will, but dude, I tell you, if if I could retire, if I, if I could retire from saving species, I mean Christ, just put put me in the ground right now. That's how I want to go out. So He's going out like a hero. Not a bad way to do it, to be honest. Do, do we also have way. like do we have the stats for like? sessions involved like how many times how many times did Diego dress compared to the others because he might have been like <laughs> might have been like an accumulator you know what I mean do you know what I was thinking as well I was thinking of those 12 females did one of them produce like 1100 <laughs> and the other like the other 11 only did like 100 like each, 10 each yeah. <laughs> yeah she's like the council state chav of like the tortoise world <laughs> just Amazing. taking all that dick <laughs> but then she she's not you don't hear about the the you know Diego's female equivalent, do you? Well, you see, there you go. See the glass ceiling applies male, in tortoise male well. bias media. That's the problem. That's true. That is well, okay. Yeah. Very yeah, good. Very fuck good. You, Diego. <laughs> do you want to know who's getting scratched, Dan? Yes, please, mate. It's Ryan Donato. See you later, mate. Oh, oh, it's terrible. See you later. Sydney Crosby oh. took his NHLPA membership. And tore it up and threw it in the bin. He said, "Nah, mate, you you don't belong here no more. You do not belong here no more." Oh my god! Uh, yeah, not a bad, 
Not a bad first night back for Mr. Mount Rushmore, was it? Just that Fucking move. That move was really God. Fun. For anyone who didn't see it, so Sid's coming, he's coming round. Let's say, let's call it down the right wing, coming right to left behind the net, behind the wild net. He's got Donato with him on the uh, on the inside. Sid comes behind the net, does the old knocks the puck from his backhand, plays it off the back of the net. Donato keeps going. Sid spins, turns back round, plays the puck across the crease, and whoever it is pops it in the back of the net. Oh my god, absolutely beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And that's why he's on that Rushmore. Who's your first scratch, Dan? <laughs> My first scratch, and it's a big one, and I hate to do it. I hate to do it. I'm so sorry, everybody. I hate to do it. But, and we've got to talk about it. I've got to scratch the All-Star game. I thought you were going to say Bernie, just... Bernie Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> can, we, can, we just, can we just do something to change it? I know they're getting new skills and new games, and that, you know, puck over the crowd thing seems like fun until... You know, someone gets one dinged off their coconut and they see the NHL for millions. That's I fine. Hope so. Oh, yeah, of God, yeah, hope so. But, like, like, how many players are not going to this already? 10, 11, <coughs> something like that, who would have been selected or who have been selected? It, it, it's kind of turned into sort of the all star reserve show. You're getting guys who are not meant to be going now being called all stars. That's not the point. And ugh, the NHL is so dumb. The NHL is so stupid. Is that especially Ovi? And Tuca, who both said the same thing. Look, I had a long season last season. I'm just going to rest up. I get a week off with my family. Why would I want to go to the All-Star game? And the NHL is punishing these players for having time off by giving them more time off. You think you can have a week off mid-season? We'll show you. How about 10 days? Uh-huh. Think about that. You like, what? Bastard. <laughs> That's insane. The punishment should be, right, well, now you've got to go and work in a labour camp. You've got to go and work in a labour camp for two weeks and then you can come back and play hockey. You've got to work harder than if you'd be playing hockey. Why would you give them extra time off? It doesn't make any sense. If, if you're you, going to punish uh, them for games off, it, you need to do it for like 10 or 15 or something. Like, it's just impossible to miss the All-Star game. Are you trying to say that Tristan Jarry isn't a worthy All-Star? You know what I mean? There's going to be three Canucks players there. Don't get me wrong. Like The Canucks have had, you know, they've had a season, I would say, that's exceeded expectations a little bit. They're playing well. But... I what? don't know though. Like, so, so one of them was voted last man in. What can what can you do about that? And that's Quinn Hughes anyway. At least Quinn Hughes deserves to. Uh, yeah, he does. He does to be there. What Jacob Markstrom? What happened with Jacob Markstrom? I'm sure somebody dropped. Somebody dropped. Oh out. Yeah, yeah. So Markstrom replaced uh, Mark Andre Fleury. Which I mean, fair enough. Who else are you gonna? Probably should have John Gibson. Really, not that he's having a great year, but he's a good good player. And then, then the other guy is fucking David Rigg. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ! I know. I'm sure lots of places. I'm sure lots of places are going to talk about this, but either change when it is, or the way it's worked, or something, because it's just it's just pointless. It's just silly. Unless, like we said before, <clears throat> uh, just just forget having games. Just forget having the games. Like you know, the three on three. Just forget it. Just just do all skills for two days. Just and just do wacky things. I don't know anything. Like puck through a burning hoop or something. I I don't know. You know what we need, but. Go on. It's got to be all rookies. Change it from the All-Star not, game to the rookie showcase. That's not a bad idea. Yeah. Because players are just not going <coughs> to... You know, you well, know yeah, the, why, why you would know you go? You can get... Yeah, it's like it's half term. Well, do, like, it, for the All-Star game should be the playoffs. You know what I mean? That's when that's when your best players are being showcased. It's the playoffs. Yeah. Use the All-Star game to showcase your rookies because they'll be more up for it. They'll probably have, have more personality and in theory, your your marketing new faces rather than you know, yeah, it'd be nice to see Sidney Crosby in the All Star game, but you're not get like you're not upping Sid's profile by him being in the in the All Star game. Not Whereas if you if you chuck in like your Quinn Hughes, your your Kerr McCars, your Victor Olofsons, that's that's gonna make a difference for them. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, because they'd they'd want to get themselves out there, wouldn't they, by doing something wacky. They'd want to kind of market themselves like, hey look at me marketing people. I'm a I'm an exciting young player in NHL. I do crazy stuff. You can build a brand around me kind of thing. And yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know. And just, it's getting ridiculous. Like you say, there's what, 10 or 11 players now who are not going. And there might be more before the, before we get to the event. And then it just becomes like, it's like the All-Star Reserve show or something. I don't know. The fucking second team All-Stars. Yeah, very weird. All right. Uh, what's your last scratch? My last scratch, let me remind myself. Oh, my last scratch is uh, one Brian McClellan. Put the uh, put the checkbook away, Brian. You shouldn't. <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing? I was meant to what ask you about this, and I forgot. What are you doing, mate? Nine and a half million. 
I know, he's 33. That's that's the problem. It's not that he's a bad player, because obviously Nicky Backstrom is a fantastic player. Yeah. But not what nine and a half million for, sorry, nine point two million for the next five years. For yeah, somebody who's gonna be thirty three when a contract starts, like Yeah, I don't like it. You wanna pay a thirty six, thirty seven and thirty eight year old Nicky Backstrom nine point two million dollars a year. I mean, I guess if somebody just gets straight to the Sharks, doesn't he? That's what, you know. <laughs> that's the idea, I suppose. So. That's, the, that's the idea, yeah. I'm not I'm not keen on that. Yeah, I don't I don't like it at all. I do no. not <laughs> like it. And, and, <laughs> and he negotiated it himself, like, surely. It's not like he was being taken <laughs> know, yeah. to the cleaners. He must have just come in and been like, this is what I want. Oh, you're driving a hard bargain, but there you go. <laughs> he came in and went, I want nine and a half. And they went, mm, 9.2? And he's like, ah, go on then. <laughs> You devils. <laughs> You've beaten me down. Yeah. Okay, so before we get to our interview, we're on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and if you listen carefully mid-flight, on the captain's uh, speaker. This week has been tough for us Brits with the uh, with the collapse of the royal family, so if you could leave a five-star review on iTunes for this show, I think it will boost the morale of the country. I was going to say, especially if we can't get Big Ben to dong on the 31st of January. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Very important uh, waste of money, that is. And you can also donate to the show at Red Circle. All right, so the chat this week is a bit different, as it was with a deaf NHL fan. Frank is responsible for the Plus Puck account on Twitter, which I think is excellent and, and well worth your time. He provides American Sign Language updates for NHL games uh, and news. Frank has been deaf from birth so we conducted the interview over, over Twitter DMs. So you could hear it. I turned the answers into a kind of script. And then I got my friend to read out Frank's responses to my questions. It's a very, very short interview. It's less than 10 minutes because obviously Frank signs and there's no, there's no fat or fluff in sign language. It's just here are the answers. This is the point. And that's how he communicated over Twitter as well. It's all, the, all his answers were just to the point. Here's my information. That's it. But it was it was fascinating and it was really interesting to talk to him. So uh, yeah, here he is, Frank from Plus Puck. Hi Frank, how you doing? I'm good, thanks. I'm going to get into this straight away. I have to ask this question first. How long have you had hearing problems? I wouldn't say I have hearing problems. I would say that I'm deaf. It's a hereditary condition that's in my entire family. Over 30 members of my family are deaf. Oh, Siblings, cousins, uncle, nephew. It runs in the family. My wife is also deaf. She works at one of the best deaf, deaf schools near Washington, D.C., and we both went to Gallaudet University, which is a university specifically for deaf and hard of hearing students. Is the university in Washington? Yes. All of the teachers communicate in ASL, which is my first language, if you will. So there must be a fairly large deaf population there, then? Yeah, there is, but there's a large... Deaf populations in all major areas of the country, New York, Texas, California, Seattle, Florida, everywhere. There are around 23 million deaf people in the United States. Okay, so because because there's a large deaf population, is there a lot to do for deaf, hard of hearing people? Yeah, there is. There's plenty to do and see. And are you, are you and your wife from Washington originally? No, we're both Canadian originally. Uh, okay, I was going to ask where the hockey fandom came from. Yeah, it's the classic Canadian hockey story. I remember watching Hockey Night in Canada on CBC when I was nine years old, and it became my passion. So do you remember the first Stanley Cup finals you watched then? Yes, it was the 74 Flyers. Oh, OK. Did you, did you play hockey as well? I did. I played a lot when I was younger. And uh, what position did you play? Uh, I played all positions, but I ended up fixing into being a goalie. Okay, that's really weird. We always have goalies on this show. I don't even know why we do, but everyone we seem to talk to is either a goalie or their kids are a goalie. I just found the challenge really exciting. I love trying to read the game and where the puck would end up. Visually, it was really exciting. Some people had the Felix Potvin style, you know, really quick movements. Ah, uh, yeah, Felix the Cat, yeah. Hey, that's a good comparison. Um, I've mentioned this before, but I played goalie, not in hockey, but other sports, and I, I love the challenge of the position. Yeah, it was like a come and challenge me, try to beat me motto. So were there, were there deaf leagues when you were younger and, and did you play in them? I played in a deaf league and a hearing league. Is the, is the deaf league different? Or are there different rules? No, no, they're all the same. The only difference with the deaf league is it's way more sociable. Oh, really? 
Yeah, before and after the game, we would socialise. In the hearing league, everyone just came and went, and there was barely any interaction or socialising outside of the games. Is that normal in the deaf community? Is it is it very social, or is it only because you're playing for a deaf team? No, I'd, I'd say it's normally social. OK, so going back to watching the Flyers then, win the Cup when you were, when you were nine, uh, is that your team now, then? I'd rather keep my team secret, but it's more a passion for hockey. Uh, we go to different games and wear different jerseys. I love going to games, and the only cities I've not been are to Winnipeg and Vegas. So how did you learn the rules or what was happening in games? Most deaf fans just understand the rules by watching the games. I guess you could say you pick it up by heart. There are many visual things that help, uh, such as the graphics on the TV or scoreboards at the arenas. The only issue is with the referees saying things before plays. Can you hear what the referee is saying? Yes, we can, although sometimes they don't give us enough information either. They update us mainly for penalties and, of course, when they use the iPad thing for offsides and such. Um, are, there, are there provisions for deaf fans at hockey games? No, there isn't. So if there's confusion on the ice regarding a call or, or something like that, how do you know what's happening? We check our phones or sometimes if I'm on my own, I'll write a note to my phone for whoever is sat next to me to help. OK, so do you go, do you go to games with other deaf fans? I'll just go on my own or with friends, just like anyone else would. There are, there are some stadiums or like, and arenas in the world that have started using hard of hearing sections for, for fans with hearing problems. Would you, would you like to try these or are you not bothered? No, it wouldn't bother me. I, I, I like to pick where I sit, just like everyone else. And, and do the scoreboards at the arenas give you enough information with regards to what's happening in the game? Yeah, they do. And are there any frustrations in, in being a deaf NHL fan? Uh, no, there aren't, there aren't any for me personally. How about in general then, sort of life as a whole? Is there anything that sort of society can do to, to aid deaf people better in their day-to-day life? I don't think so. We live perfectly fine. You know, we all work, travel, get around as independently as everyone else. We attend sports games and there are lots of access here for deaf people. So if you're watching hockey or another sport on TV, do you ever use uh, like closed captioning? There is closed captioning available on sports broadcasts, but some deaf people prefer not to use it as it takes up part of the screen. You want to see as much action as possible. I don't mind closed captioning, but I don't often use it while I'm watching NHL. Oh, of course, I never thought of that because, yeah, the words come up on the screen, don't they? So it will blank out some of the action. Do you, do you think uh, deaf people notice people's body language more? And uh, can, you, can you read lips? Some people use body language a lot. And I can lip read sometimes, depending on who I'm talking to. But I always prefer to use sign language. Have you ever tried to learn another country sign language? Um, I actually went to Scotland as an exchange student for a few months when I was in high school. So I got to learn some British sign language. What's, what's the best way for someone who can hear to communicate with someone who is deaf? Writing on paper or just texting each other. Uh, you can sometimes use body language to tell someone who can hear what you want. Uh, you know, there's lots of hearing people, though, who can use uh, ASL. Maybe they have deaf parents, children, friends. Actually, yeah, that's true, because I, I work with nurses, and, and some of those have learned British Sign Language, so they can talk to patients, usually usually children. Um, why did you start providing ASL NHL updates on Twitter? I started last fall. People asked me to start ASL update videos for deaf people, and they recommended that I use Twitter for anyone who may like ASL updates. Most deaf people prefer watching ASL videos about the NHL because we don't like to waste time, and ASL is most deaf people's primary language. My videos reflect that, and currently, currently there aren't any ASL video updates for the NHL. Yeah, that's right. Yours are, yeah, yours are just to the point. Yeah, short and sweet. I just provide the facts. I don't give any opinions. Have you ever considered starting a website for this kind of thing? I would like to, but someone would have to help me. I would have no idea on how to start, so for now they're just fine on Twitter. A lot of people are not aware that there are ASL videos regarding the NHL. I also use the Daily Moth, which is a Facebook page, which is one of the best news places I can find. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to mention? Yeah, there are actually some players with connections to being deaf. Larry Playfair and Dave Snuggerud both know American Sign Language and I've spoken to them. Also at the moment in the WHL, there are two brothers, Ozzy and Orca Weisblatt. 
their mum is deaf and they both know ASL. I wanted to try and get more people to see your work as I think you're doing a great job. And if it drives more deaf people to your videos or even people who can hear to your videos that they can share out, then great. Um, can you just let people know where they can find your videos? Yeah, sure. It's at plus puck on Twitter. Make sure you tell all your friends. Thanks, Dan. Uh, no problem, Frank. Thank you. There we go. Thank you to Frank. Thank you to my mate Richard for um, for reading out Frank's responses. If you want to send him hate messages on Twitter, uh, please do. I don't mind. He's not that good a friend. Before we get to the news... <laughs> he's, he, said, he said he's going to listen to this, so I had to say that. Before we get to the news, it is brought to you by Wave Intel. If you want to avoid that messy divorce because you and your wife can't agree on which team's got the best power play, then head over to Wave Intel and at Wave Intel on Twitter. They use simple graphics and stats to plot side-by-side analysis of teams and players, and it gives you all the information at the touch of a button. Wave Intel online and on Twitter. Being smart so you don't have to be. All right. Christ, the news. Where do we start? Firings? Uh, Fights? Yeah, yeah we, can do do? The, uh, we can do the firings, yeah. All right, let's start with Ray Shiro then. It's, uh, just just to get straight into it, because everyone's, everyone's talking about Ray Shiro's been fired. It's a bit like the Chiarelli one. And like, I don't get why, <laughs> in a very specific reason, uh, I don't get why <laughs> repeatedly we're seeing people get fired from positions in you know, across loads of sports like really soon after doing quite important things for their clubs because like what <laughs> D- taylor hall was traded a month ago less than a month ago less yeah about less yeah sure it was less than a month ago and it's like if you don't trust ray shiro enough to fire him like nothing so drastic has happened in that last four weeks i don't think that has changed Ray Shiro's competency at the job sort of thing, you know what I mean? The I trajectory of the Devils doesn't change that much. So what, you trust him enough to trade your star player, but then you're still going to fire him. It just, uh, it's just weird. I know. They must have, here's the thing. They must have had an idea that they weren't happy with him before the Taylor Hall thing happened. They yeah, must absolutely. have had like an inkling of, God, this season's been fucking shy, hasn't it? Yeah, should we get rid of Ray? Yeah, let's. Hang on, we've got an MVP to trade first. Let's just do this and get it, and then we'll fire him. What? Yeah, we'll, we'll make him do that. We'll make him do that. That'll <laughs> learn him. What are, you, what are you doing? I just don't understand. <clears throat> not to strictly say that they'd have got on a better return without Ray Shiro, or like, but it's just, it's just weird. I, I, I just don't understand it. Like, I'd, I'd really love to be educated more on on, on why you know team presidents and owners and stuff are continually letting letting this happen i know did they think they were going to trade away a former heart winner and then get better i mean yeah yeah we'll give him we'll give him one last chance and let him yeah. trade taylor hall like because obviously you know they, they were going to trade taylor hall no matter what so it's not like it's not like um shiro did something as like a, a maverick or a renegade or anything <laughs> but yeah it's just I, maybe that's what happened maybe he got wind of it and he was like shit I better do this whole trade now really fuck him over better sort us out <laughs> yeah. fuck him drop PK Subban as well we'll retain all the salary <laughs> yeah car mate yeah I mean not that I'd necessarily think that Shiro shouldn't have been fired like they've made basically no progress since he, he's got there and and in some ways it shows that these owners are the they're kind of yeah you've seen teams rot with a GM for longer than this just because yeah. they're expecting to be bad. So it does reflect an element of now we're expecting more out of the club sort of thing we want to see, especially as if, if they just look a little bit north to the Rangers. Like You'd say the Rangers are on a better trajectory than the Devils and they've been rebuilding yeah. a lot less longer and they've had yeah. 100% fewer first overall picks. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah, that's the thing, wasn't it? The Rangers was, I mean, it's a fast rebuild. When did they send that letter out? Was it two trade deadlines ago? And we talked about it, saying, yeah. "Holy shit, the Rangers are just." Here's, here's the truth. Sorry, fans, we're trading everything. We'll try and make it better. Stick with us, kind of thing. And we kind of said, "Ah, right, you know what? Fair play to the owners. There's some balls there to do that." And at the moment, it's looking like it's kind of it's worked out well. Yeah, and yeah, I, I agree. I agree completely. You know, like. I mean, what the Devils have been the, made the playoffs once since two thousand and twelve. Yeah, and and that was on the back of Taylor Hall just absolutely destroying everything in his path. Yeah, so like Shiro had Taylor Hall land in his lap due to the <coughs> Teflon Don stupidity, <coughs> and he had two first overall picks. 
and they still only won one playoff game in four years. I mean, I get it. The two first overall picks, it's hard because it's not it's not McDavid or Crosby or it's not that even, level. Even Matthews or anything like that. Like, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, to be a good point, or even Matthews. And they've, those players have not made an impact straight away. And maybe they will be great in the next five or six years or something after all this development and all that kind of thing. But, you know, looking at those kind of stats and what you're going to do, you're going to, this season has been a disaster. You're going to, you're just going to tank again for another, you know, it just doesn't look good. None of his trades worked out from this, you know, this off season, which were obviously there to try and placate Hall in some way. But Subban, Simmons, Gusev, you know, none of those worked out. He didn't even have, like, he didn't even have a good kind of player acquisition. You could hang his hat on and say, at least I did this. He didn't swing a deal for Taylor Hall, did he? He just got him fucking like, like he just, he just he was like a baby in a basket. Yeah, yeah. Ray Shear opens the front door one day to Devil's office, and there's Taylor Hall in a basket. Like, oh my god, who are you? I'd, I'd say the you other know. good, like Nikita Gusev is doing well this year, but then to an extent, that's the same sort of idea as as the Taylor Hall trade in, in a lot of ways because the the de- uh, the Knights were cap strapped, and it just so happened that the Devils were ones that were around to be able to take him, pick him up. Yeah, and with the with the first overall pick thing. He sure and uh, and Hughes aren't of the McDavid level, but they're still handy players. And the the problem is, you shouldn't be relying on the the immediate success of your draft picks to prove your worth as a as a GM anyway. Like they should be yeah sort of, exactly they should be bonuses on top of the good team that you're already building. And he's yeah, and as a, as a GM, you're. Like as we talked about the other week about maybe a little project for the off season, your it's it's your drafting in rounds sort of three, four, five, six, seven. That's what you should be judged on. Not taking a player first overall because that doesn't mean anything. Who who couldn't make that pick? It, that's obvious. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's not good GMing to have Jack Hughes be first overall because he's first overall. That's that's got nothing to do with it. You know. Yeah, um, and, and you've done a bad job if you then turn around and say, oh, this team would be better if it wasn't for my 18-year-old centre not scoring at a point per game. Yeah, exactly. Not surprised that all he's been fired, but just bizarre. Just, just weird, bizarre the way to timing. do it. Yeah, definitely. As Happy. usual. There you go. I look forward to Dean Lombardi taking over in, uh, in New Jersey. <laughs> all right, let's get to uh, Vegas, shall we? Uh, as a manager, sometimes you have a feeling that something isn't uh, the way you, you need it to be or want it to be. We feel uh, we've underperformed uh, a little bit, and certainly that's not to pile out at the feet of Mike and Gerard, but you know, sometimes you feel a change is needed. So that was uh, uh, you know, what went into the decision. Uh, like anything we do, we try to do what we genuinely believe is in the best interest of the Golden Knights organization, and uh, that's what we've done in this case. Let's, let's, uh, let's again yeah money. fucking yeah. everyone knows what's happened go on you, you can start on this one oh, I'd, I'd rather not because I don't know what to say like, what the fuck Vegas are three points out of first place in the Pacific they have lost four in a row but as I've mentioned I think twice this season already it's ridiculous how many teams so far this season have lost four games in a row or more it's something like 21 out of or 22 out of 31 teams have gone on runs like this and it, it happens to like Every like you know, fifteen or sixteen teams every year. Anyway, you are going to go on a bit of a in in an eight, especially in January. Like you're going to go on a bit of a slump. That's not particularly abnormal. This is either going to turn out to be really stupid or really genius. Because like, are they getting out in front of it? They're saying, right, we're not where we should be now. Let's get rid of the coach. You know, let's let's forego any sense of giving him a chance to sort it out. He clearly hasn't done the job. Let's. Let's strike while the iron's hot, sort of thing. Because there's a good coach out there, kind of thing. Well, I mean, Peter Ball's fine, but I think he's. I think I like the ball. I think he's honestly. I do think he's a good coach. Yeah, I really I, do. I think he's good. But is he? Be, is he any better than Gerald Gallant? Right. I wouldn't. I wouldn't strictly say yeah, so. I don't, I don't know. I, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. But then do you risk? Are, I mean, are you, if things are you carry just on this that downward, change of voice really early, sort of thing. Getting the maybe not even a change situation. of voice. Yeah, maybe not even a change of voice. It might be a case of. <laughs> De Boer's out there. If we don't do this now, he might go somewhere else, kind of thing. We'd rather grab him now while he's there. Yeah, but I don't think you're deliberately sacking... You can't be happy with the job that Glant's doing if you're sacking him. Like, De Boer's not that... He's not a bad coach, I'm not saying that at all. I think he's, yeah, he's a you're good right. coach, but you're he's right. not of the level. He's not like Joel Quenneville. 
It's not like let's let's sack off our guy no matter what so we can get him. Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. You're right. So yeah, it's just it's just really weird. Especially I'm trying like, to make. <laughs> I'm just trying to make sense of it. <laughs> that's the thing, and this is a guy who, in Gerald Glant, like again, like, you're not in the room, so you don't know, but the the story was like he'd really brought that group together after the expansion draft, and surely that's got to have some sort of cachet with with the players. More so, you know, he's got to be more have have a better reputation with his players than a lot of other coaches do. Maybe that's right, or maybe he was maybe he was too close to the players or something. Maybe, maybe too, the players were too close to him or something. Too pally. And the ownership were just thinking he's they're not working hard enough because he's too soft or they're not scared of him, they like him too much or I, I don't know. It's very peculiar. Shout out to the news brought to you by Wave Intel. I was looking at some of the uh Jason from Wave Intel put the the stats up, a comparison side by side this season, last season for Vegas and there's barely any difference now I get it it's kind of a small it's a smaller sample size this season but if you just go to at Wave Intel on Twitter there's the uh, you can find the uh, the picture there of the comparison for the for Vegas for this season and last season but I mean they seemingly I mean five on five all these numbers are negligible they're very very close they concede more goals this season they've scored less goals but it's it's like 2.4 to 2.6 and 2.5 to 2.4 it's kind of nothing really and on special teams, they score way more goals this season and they concede a few more goals. So like 5.9 to 8.3. And the penalty kill is 6.7 to 7.6. So, I mean, it's not like they've fallen off a cliff or... Yeah, I just, I don't, I just don't get it. I don't get it I mean, at all. I guess when you, look at, when you look to that roster and you're like, all right, Stone... I mean, that's, we talked about the second line, didn't we? <clears throat> at the start of the season that was just like terrifying. Should should they be running away with that division? Do you think? Yeah, I think I think they should. Like the 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 explanation is, they should be comfortably in the playoff spot, and they're not. So it's the baffling thing about it is we're so used to coaches being given the chance to turn it around, whereas Gallant just hasn't been. So yeah, be interesting to see. I mean, they're not. They're only out of a playoff spot on a tiebreaker anyway. That's yeah. the that's the mental thing, and like yeah, the Canucks have got two games in hand on them, as do the Jets, but they're not like miles out. They're only, they're three points back off the top of the division for God's sakes. It's just really weird, really really weird. It could prove to be the right decision in the long term. It's just so against the sort of against the grain, as it were. I was thinking about the the rosters, and I was thinking if you put the the, the Vegas roster compared to everyone else in the Pacific. Would you take that roster over every? Would you take that roster over any other roster in the Pacific? And you might, but then we talked about like we talked about the decor, didn't we? Yeah, it's not very good, is and, it? Really? And the D men are they're, they're good, but you haven't got that that guy. You know, it's like Nate Schmidt, Shay Theodore, Braden McNabb, Nick Holden, John Merrill, Nick Kay, Derek Englund. I mean, it's not. I think I think Shay Theodore will become that guy. Yeah, don't, yeah, like I say, you know, these are not bad players. They're good players, but then saying that, I mean, they're. F- the forward course fucking ridiculous. Like ridiculous. Yes. Like their top their top six earning forwards are Mark Stone, Max Pacioretty, Paul Stastny, William Carlson, Riley Smith, and Jonathan Marshall. So Yeah, it's I mean, ridiculous. That is unbelievable. So when you say that, I mean, yeah. They should have more maybe more points than they do. That's the thing. And by by that measure, like you've got a yeah, the classic thing of you can't fire all the players, but at the same time with this roster you don't want to trade any of the players, do you? No, you don't. You don't really. In in theory, you should be able to have success with any odd mug behind the bench. So you've got to kind of test that theory before you start doing anything crazy. Yeah, it'd be know. interesting to see what happens, uh, see if De Boer turns it around for him. I mean, if Gerard Gallant... I mean, I put this on Twitter, but Gerard Gallant has to go to the Sharks now, doesn't he? Just to... <laughs> yeah, yeah, legally. He has to. He has to. Well, does Just he to, to keep it all going. Does he have to go to the Devils first? Because De Boer went from the Devils to the Sharks to the Knights. Oh, good point. Um, if only John Hines was a... Uh, maybe we'll add an extra <laughs> thing and the Sharks will get a Laviolette. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Gallant goes to the Devils. The rumour's already started that Gerard Gallant's maybe going to be on his way to Detroit. But why? why? Why would Detroit do that? I mean, you want to keep the current regime going so they shit out as worse as possible. <laughs> yeah, that's, just, like, that's the thing. Do you know what I mean? Jeff Flasher was doing exactly what he's meant to be doing. 
Yeah, you don't want a coach going in there turning things around. That's the worst thing Detroit could happen to Detroit right now. Exactly. But then, I don't know, do you trust Gallant to be able to coach team badly, deliberately? If he's, well, if guess, he's a good I mean, coach, guess, he's got to be able to know what he's doing, you know what I mean? Well, I, guess, I, mean, I guess all you do is you just say to Gallant, can you do us a favour, stay safe until the summer, don't go snowboarding down any big mountains or anything, just, just sit at home and we'll pay you to sit at home somehow. And then you can come and look, you know, come back to us in the summer. <laughs> name him, name him the coach, but then just don't have him come into work. <laughs> so don't name him the coach, and then suspend him for two months due to some weird funky rule. <laughs> so, and then bring him back in the summer. Just could just have no head coach. Player power. Player, yeah, player power. Yeah, exactly. Just have have Dylan Larkin lead the team. That'd be fine. All the team, all the te- every, every Detroit game, every team's picked on a vote. <laughs> It's just done on rotate, pure rotation. Like, oh, right, it's, yeah, it's uh, like a it's like a rotor for nurses. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dylan, you're playing uh, third pair in D tonight. There we go. Anthony Manthe, you're uh, you're second line centre. Congratulations. <laughs> Anthony Manthe, you're backup goalie. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Howard, first line right wing. Let's get it yeah. going, son. A little interesting stat is that uh, Joel Quenville is currently the 18th longest serving head coach right now. <laughs> <laughs> Have there really been 13 coaches great? hired since Quenville was hired in the summer? That's what I read on Twitter. And as you know, I am prone to believe these things. So I went with it. I mean, I do want to double check that. I do want to double check that. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Jesus fucking Christ, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Twitter never fails me. That's fucking mental, that. But that's only just because of like when he was hired sort of thing. That's only by... Yeah, like a week more than Elaine Vigneault, like a week more than Tom McClellan. That's beautiful. That is beautiful. Seven coaches fired in season. Seven? Seven yeah. The record's, the record's 11. That's crazy. I don't think we'll hit that far. No. I can't, I mean, see, I can't see anybody else making any changes now, to be honest. I'd be surprised. Um, just looking at the more tenured ones. No, I don't think there's anyone. <laughs> I was thinking more John Hines again. <laughs> just get him straight back out. Get get Gerald Gallant in. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine that? Oh, please, God. Please let that happen. That'll be so good. Any guesses for uh, the longest tenured? Can you, can you do the top three for me? Because two are quite... Oh. Not obvious, but relatively obvious. And one of them's less so. Is one Cassidy? No. He is... No. Eight. He's eighth. He's eighth. Oh god, I'm terrible at stuff like this. All right, come on, Daniel. Come on, Daniel. Think you can do this. Oh, Mike Sullivan. Uh, no fifth. Ah, oh, getting closer. You're getting closer. A lot closer. God, you say two of them are obvious. I'm terrible at this kind of thing. The top ones. Oh, are... Jeff. Jeff Blashill. Yeah, Jeff Blashill was number three. That's the one that I was shocked about. Right. <laughs> then top one. So top one's an Eastern Conference team. You know, you just can't get something out of your head and it, you just keep saying it over and over again in your head. Is it, Mike, just, is it Mike Sullivan? It was, yeah. <laughs> I can't. I just can't get his stupid face out of my head. So what, uh, what, what do you have to be if you stay in a, lot, a job for a long time, Dan? Old. Yeah, but to get to that point, you have to have been... <laughs> That's shagged your way to the top. <laughs> Wait, which is an indicator <laughs> of some level of success, isn't it? <laughs> Success. Success. Who's, that sec- who's that success? I can't even think. Well, hang on, hang on, hang on. Relative. Oh, fucking hell. Uh, John Cooper. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Oh, fucking hell. Stupid boy. Any uh, any guesses and, from number uh, two? Western Conference this time. Oh, Maurice. Yeah, there you go. Fucking hell. There you go. There you go. Got and, you just said. and so number four, just to round out the top five, gone. As he as he got Sullivan, a legend in the game. Ooh, oh, torts. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Be a I'm going to edit this Only... down, but that's that's way longer than it should have done. Oh yeah, definitely. Only two <laughs> coaches have been in the game, been at, been at their clubs for longer than five years, which is weird. That's insane, isn't it? Very, very weird. It's not usually all on the coach, is it? It could be just a shit GM picking, you know, like drafting bad players, or you know what I mean, like giving out bad contracts and things like that. So, for once, as we mentioned on this podcast a few times over the years, calling the Battle of Alberta the Battle of Alberta was stupid because 
you would have games where there was four penalty minutes and it finished one nil. And I remember coming on this show and saying, why are we calling the Battle of Alberta? This is ridiculous. It's it's not a battle anymore. Both these teams are useless. Thank God. Thank God. The Battle of Alberta is back. Because <laughs> Matthew now. Kachuk and Zach Cassian <laughs> gave us something to get our teeth into. In deep position, gets bumped hard by you-know-who, Kachuk. And Cassian's mad, and here we go. Now there's going to be penalties in the game. They've been going at each other on and off all night, and Zach Cassian is incensed. Now, we showed earlier in the first period the one hit that knocked his helmet off, and I don't know if you could hear, but it was McDavid yelling at Cassian to have his head up because he saw coming back from his point coverage to Chuck coming down. And yeah, I mean, I think those are uh, there's a lot up for grabs tonight. So you got to do whatever it takes to to go and get that win. Yeah, I mean, well, if he you know doesn't want to get a hit, then stay off the tracks. Um, you know, he's caught him three times there, so I think he'd learn after the first one. But if he wants to react like that, we'll take the power play, we'll take the game winner, and we'll move on to first place. No, I do it again, all over again. It's one of those things. Um, after speaking with Paris on the phone, he explained how the hit. Is not dirty, so that cleared up a lot of. That gave me some clarity of what you can do and what you can't do now. So I put that in the memory bank. In the back. Uh, for sure, yeah, definitely. But like I said, um, there's no penalty call. I'm not. I'm not crying about the hits. It's it's hockey. It's a game of hockey. It's rough. I thought uh, they're a little bit uh, on the blind side, but at the end of the day, I've laid uh, big hits like that. Um, I've been hit like that. Like that. Um, but um, two times uh, is more than enough. You play with fire, eventually you're going to get burned. And uh, he, he messed with the wrong guy, and uh, I don't think he realizes that we're in the same division and uh, have a great memory. A couple of things out of this. Well, a few, a few things out of this. Let's start with Kachuk's hits, Will. Not great, are they? <laughs> no. No, not great. Not, not the epitome of, of, of a good, clean check, but... They're, they're they're not that great. So the the first one is is the one that gets a lot of the uh, has been getting a lot of the attention, and for me like, but it is it's within the rules, you know. Not that I'm oh, see, I, I think that's I think that first one's terrible. I think it's terrible. Yeah, but it but it's but it's within the rules. Like it's not charging because he changes direction, and it, the principal point of contact isn't the head, even though the majority of the contact ends up to the head. Yeah, he comes well out of position to hit Cassian. It's still it's still technically legal in a sort of not paying your taxes by having your money in an offshore account kind of technically legal. Um, <laughs> <coughs> they're not good. I'm not advocating for, for players to run around and hit people like that, but it's a it's a problem with the rule book where that sort of that sort of hit is you know, luckily we don't see that sort of hit every night, but he's technically allowed to do that. The second one, like I feel like I've not seen as much coverage of the second one. Like physically haven't seen as many replays because it's all focused on the aftermath and or the hit before. Yeah, I think the second one's I think the second one isn't that bad, but obviously because it's after the first one, that's why uh that's why obviously why Cassian sees red. And he, literally uh, he comes in fucking hot didn't he <laughs> on that second one I'll Jesus say Christ. Jesus Christ fucking like I mean that's some kind of ragdolling you get on GTA 5 when someone blows you up and your, your body just like flails through the air like a crash test dummy because that was insane that was I haven't seen a play ragdoll like that for a long time that was that was mental so what, what do you think about Cassian's reaction then I'm looking forward to this on the ice or is or afterwards in the press conference. Oh Jesus Christ. Uh, <laughs> let's start with on the ice. On the ice I can kind of I can see why he did it. I do get it. I because I've said I said before, I, I can sit here and say X, Y, and Z, but you put me in that position, I'd probably do the same thing. I, I'd start to get the feeling this guy's just targeting me. He's he's being predatory towards me personally, and I would take it personal. For I, right or wrong, I would. And, is, and it, I think, is there an element of sorry to cut you off, like that's like right. fear in it of like you could really fucking hurt me, like you almost you almost fucking hurt me there, like I get yeah. really pissed off if someone's driving dangerously and I almost gets it or whatever. That similar sort of 
first one's down low. Cassian takes a hit to the head. Again, not intentionally, but he does. Mm. And then the second one takes the hit, goes into the boards. We're looking at it from an outside point of view. If you're Cassian, a guy's hit you in the head on purpose, and then he's tried to ram you into the boards. That's what you're thinking at that time. A question out of this, we'll we'll come quickly to Cassian's press conference (laughs) in a second. Question out of this then, Matthew Kachuk, great professional troll or dangerous prick who needs to be taught a lesson? Uh, Troll, I suppose. Because, like, again, legal hit. (laughs) He's playing on the edge, though, isn't he? He is playing on the edge right now. He's close. Oh, yeah, definitely. But then that's that's what it is. Like, True. That's all part of it. Like, he doesn't... Yeah, you know, while we've said I understand why Cassian did it, I'm still not... What he did was ridiculous. Like, that's not right at all. You've got to just accept that that's part of the game sort of thing. Especially where, like, Cassian would be throwing them hits himself. I'm sure if we had enough time to look back through every body check he's ever thrown, he's probably got a decent percentage of his that look like those fucking Cassian hit, uh, those Kachuk hits. Let alone if you're throwing the idea of it being targeted, which I'm sure he's done plenty of in his own career. Yeah. I, I just don't think there's any... Yeah, challenge him to a fight, say I want to beat the shit out of you because you're being dangerous. But like Kachuk is under no obligation within the rule book to accept that fight and if Kachuk's not a willing combatant to to not only throw multiple punches to the back of a kid's head when he's on the ice but prior to that the the thing about the the physical side of it on the ice Cassian's like you know seeing red moment that's the the bit that scares me and horrifies me the most out of that is the way he yanks Kachuk back dude so scary. Like, mate, if that didn't... If if Cassian wasn't lucky, that could have been back of the head straight into the ice. Blood, brains all over the floor, and we're having a very different conversation about Mac Chuck today. That's, yeah, sure. that's the bit that, to me, right, yeah, you're pissed off. Right, you're scared, or whatever it might be. You know, like, Chuck's actions aren't, aren't exactly uh, rosy. But that is it. That is unforgivable. That's inexcusable conduct. And I think for that action alone, that should have been like five games for Cassian. Let alone the fighting bit. That's the bit that, that is really not right. I mean, it's kind of short-sighted from Department of Player Safety to give him those two games and then the first game back is Flames Oilers. Oh, mate, yeah. Like, that's, that's I mean... a weird thing, though, isn't it? Because, like, what do you... Do you give him an extra game just because of who the opponent is? I know, it's tricky. <coughs> it's tricky, but... I mean, Christ! After after Cassian's press conference, I, I'm, I'm surprised they didn't just. I'm surprised someone didn't ring him mid press conference and say, "Shut up, or you're getting another game just because." I, th- I think you should, like, he's... because to, to say like, <laughs> well, I guess I'm, I know what I'm going to do now. That's it. Okay. I guess I was hit to fine, so I'll do that now. Kachuk's hits were predatory. There's no doubt about it, but they were premeditated necessarily or at least we don't have proof that they were premeditated Zach Cassian is saying two weeks before he plays this game I'm going to go out there and hit Mac Chuck in the head like Jesus fucking Christ yeah if he goes behind the net I'm aiming for him basically that's sketchy and that's that's exactly like I, th- I think you're right like whether you're joking or not like you should get an extra game for a suspension if not two, for, for threatening a player off the ice. Because, yeah, here's the problem. If if Cassian drills Kachuk into the boards now or something, and Kachuk gets injured, everyone's going to say, well, we, you knew he was going to do that. Yeah. Why, why did yeah, you do exactly. something about it before it happened? He's going to go after him. There's no doubt about it. What gives you that idea? And I, <laughs> <laughs> and I, don't, I don't know if this point, if, I mean, Zach Cassian even cares or not about what's going to happen to him in regards to suspensions or anything like that. He's just, he doesn't care. And then to do it, (laughs) and then to do another press conference after the morning skate and still be saying those things. Like, (laughs) what are you doing? (laughs) Shut up. I've been beating people up since I was nine years old and I'll continue (laughs) to beat people up. (laughs) I will continue to try and injure players as long as I play in this league and I'm not suspended. (laughs) As is my God-given right as an ice hockey player. What are you talking about, you fucking psychopath? (laughs) I know. If he'd not said anything, it wouldn't matter. If he'd that's, not said anything and just drilled Kachuk in the next game, it wouldn't have mattered. 
Well, it would matter, but it wouldn't have been like this. But now everyone's just revved up, and everyone's going to get revved up. The building's going to be revved up. Both sets of players are going to be revved up. Like you, and you I just, know for a fact that oh. in every single NHL locker room before every single game, there are players on both sides that are saying, behind closed doors to their teammates, oh, I'm going to try and lay out whoever it might be tonight. Yeah, X, Y, Z. Whoever it might be, is like, right, I'm going to try and light them up, whatever it is, in cold blood. <laughs> but I fucking, to, to say, yeah, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to literally murder him. <laughs> I think even if he doesn't get that suspension, and and if you look at the suspension, like yeah, if player safety thought two games is right, fair enough, whatever, it's not their responsibility to extend it just because they're playing the Flames. That should be on. True. It, yeah, it's up to the players to, to know better, <laughs> or or even just on Edmonton coaching and management to maybe say yeah. Right, Cassian's not in the right headspace for this one. We should scratch him because he's going to be dangerous out there. That's like an internal thing, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, Do you up. think, here's a question. Do you think if Zach Cassian was Conor McDavid and this had happened, it would have been different? Yeah, because I doubt Conor McDavid would have come back out and said, I'm going to kill Mac Chuck. I've been beating up <laughs> people since I was four years old. Um... <laughs> <clears throat> Matthew Kachuk hits Conor McDavid the way he hits Zach Cassian. <laughs> the first one especially. That's Conor McDavid, not Zach Cassian. Do you think anything yeah. changes? Yeah, of course, because no one really cares about Zach Cassian, do they? Nobody does. Yeah, it's hor- no it's a horrible one. thing to say, but yeah, yeah it is no, different. No one gives a shit, partly because of the table he's made for himself sort of thing. Like, Cassian plays that style himself. But yeah, if it had happened to McDavid or Crosby or Giroud or whoever it might be, like, yeah, we're having very different conversations about it. Very different conversations entirely. But the, the, like you we know said at the start, it's not to, we're not excusing what Matt Chuck has done, apart from the fact that no. unfortunately it is within the confines of the rule book. Like he's not, he's not played fairly or very gentlemanly. Like that's not bringing him back towards the Lady Bing conversation. But um, he's technically allowed to do it. <laughs> Just a couple more things on this. I will say though that the dumb male side of my brain cannot wait for this game now. Like, oh fuck yeah! I'm so excited for this Oilers. I cannot wait to see these two try and kill each other. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm such a hypocrite. I know I am, but God Almighty, buzzing for it. I wish. I wish. Um, I wish one of the teams was actually the Islanders, or or they could play it at um, what's the the Barclay Centre, and they could Barclays, swap yeah. that uh, swap that SUV for an ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> Just have it there in the corner. Waiting. <laughs> Just blue lights on ready. <laughs> Just ready to like engine on, everything ready to go. Paddle um fucking what are they called? Like you know those resource paddles. Resource paddles charged. Just yeah, ready yeah. to go. Uh oh. Defibrillator. <laughs> That's it, yeah. <laughs> Defibrillator charged and ready. <laughs> All the gel on, everything. <laughs> <laughs> fucking hell. <laughs> Oh, fantastic. And did you know, did you know as well that a Flames fan started a GoFundMe to put billboards of Matthew Kachuk around Edmonton and he's already made his goal? <laughs> That's amazing. Idiots. Absolutely fucking It's so idiots. great. This is why sports is the best. It's so That's so funny. On the page it said that fans in Edmonton um, deserve to see much more of Matthew Kachuk. They're going to get billboards up of him. Oh, dear. Have you, um, have you heard about the Matthew Pro stuff from today? Before we started the show, I just added a little thing on the run sheet, which was Jake Vitanen's hit on Matthew Perot. I haven't seen the hit, but I've I've heard Matthew Perot's comments. Mate, it's fucking, it's what? so, it's so egregious. It's so much worse than Matthew Kachuk. Is it really? I can't even. I mean, he literally leads with his elbow into Matthew Perot's head. It's unbelievable. Tell me more. Tell me more. You can, if you if you just type in. If you just type in Vatan and Perot on YouTube, and then there's a, there's a the thumbnail is Matthew Perot in his locker talking to the media. The hit is on that video. It doesn't look it doesn't look like it, but it's on that video. Oh, I see it here. Sportsnet got to see it. Matthew Perot is the same head injury from beautiful elbow. I can't, so what? I'm all right. I'm watching it now. Oh, here we go. Spotlight and everything. <laughs> what the fuck? It's like a forearm shiver. I know. And just nothing, nothing from Department of Player Safety. 
Good fucking stops beforehand, doesn't it? <laughs> Jesus They're a fucking Christ. joke. They're an absolute joke. I don't know what they do over there, but they're fucking... I don't know if anyone can hear this, but I hope this someday just finds something, but you're fucking useless. You're useless. That is a terrible hit. Terrible. Who who could have seen George Paros making such a meal of this? Who would have known? Who who could have predicted that? That said, again, terrible hit. Terrible, terrible, terrible hit, but Matthew Perot saying he has <laughs> gotta take matters into my own hands next time. I'm a little Should we do the bit? I'm a little guy. <laughs> so I can't, I'm not the biggest so guy. I can't, fight. I can't yeah. I have to use my stick to protect myself. What the fuck? What the fuck? He said, he literally said, the next time someone does that, I'm swinging my stick at their head. That's what he said. Oh, what the hell, mate? Like, someone's in the, someone's that, in though, the air this week. They that, breed- though, I have no pro- that, I have no problem with that. <sighs> I would be livid. If I was Matthew Perot and some guy comes at me like that, elbow out, like you say, forearm shivers me and nothing's done about it I'd be swinging my stick the next game for sure fucking because animals. what's he supposed to do it's the department of play how many times have we had this conversation about play safety what the fuck are they doing over there they're yeah, useless like, what? that's right. such a, that's a suspension <laughs> that's, that's so you, such a suspension so you, so you get mugged on a Friday night and the police don't do anything about it so you take a fucking gun and like <laughs> shoot up the shopping centre like here's the thing though right this is yes. We're not doing this again. We're not doing this again. That's what you're saying. That's what you're saying. You're but this is you're advocating revenge killings. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because look, in Matthew Perot's world now, it's a. This is going to sound crazy. I know you're going to laugh. It's a lawless society. Okay. <laughs> Lords of the flies out there. Yeah, because so- a player has just elbowed me in the head, and it's not. It's not, well, the primary point of... No, the primary point of contact was my head with his elbow. He Damn. elbowed me in the head, and the law has done nothing about it. So I've now got to look after myself to stop players taking advantage of me because the law is not going to do that for me. They're not looking after me, so I've got to look after myself. I've got to police myself. If if Matthew Bro didn't want to get elbowed in the head, they shouldn't have a fucking head. <laughs> It's true. What, it is what, true. What, what do you want? What do you want from me? What's uh, what? Yeah, you know, have head, get elbowed, as the as the saying goes. It's a fair point. It's a fair point. Like, yeah, there should be supplemental discipline. There should have been fucking. On, was there even a penalty on the play? I don't. I don't know. I'd assume I was too not. busy. I would. Yeah, I would assume not as well. But still, to but, to have players that are freely going out saying in media scrums, I'm going to deliberately aim to injure players next time I'm playing this beautiful game no matter what circumstances are leading to that sort of statement like that's not fucking okay that's not that's that's mental it is kind of mental but when the law doesn't protect you what are you supposed to do the law doesn't protect you he's not he's not fucking Batman the law's not protecting him Matthew Perot is not being protected by the laws of the game which should be that play that did that to you will learn his lesson because we're going to suspend him. What lesson has what lessons Jake Vatana learned here? I can elbow players in the head. It's fine. That's what lesson he's learned. He's learned Matthew Pro needs to sort his fucking life out. Say so. The, the, so the whole we, thing, the whole thing we had, the whole thing we essentially got around to when we did the Wilson Reeves thing was, don't need nothing would have happened if players like Tom Wilson, when he was doing what he was doing had been taken care of properly by the Department of Player Safety and been like, all right, you've been to see us like six times in the past 18 months or whatever. You know, it was something ridiculous. And at some point, you're going to get a 25, 30 game suspension and it's going to really cost you money, like real money, that you're actually going to miss. And, and until that point, until the Department of Player Safety pulls the finger out their ass, this is what you're going to get. The right, the right, And I love Ryan Reeves. The Ryan Reeves of the world are still going to have a job to do what they do, which is run people over, because the Department of Player Safety is not protecting players, are they? They're just not. But then the the standing theory is that the reason the suspensions aren't higher is because the GMs and the NHLPA lobby for the suspensions to not be higher so that their members don't lose out more money. So in theory, players like Zach Cassian and, and Matthew Perot should be going to the NHLPA 
and advocating for longer suspensions. Because I'm sure if if, if Zach Cassian, sorry, if Matthew Perot accidentally catches someone high with an elbow, like I don't know too much about Perot as a player, but I don't I don't get the impression that he's particularly dirty. That said, stuff happens out there, and sometimes you you make a mistake and you you do something dirty inadvertently. Say he does something that's worth suspending, and he's and he he wants more, you know, retro, repercussions from player safety. He's probably not going to be fucking happy if he gets a five gamer for an accidental elbow, is he? So it's about well, no, but then that's that's the thing. That's when it's all what are the Department of Player Safety doing? They just kind of seemedly pick suspensions yeah. out of a hat. Yeah, or so they throw what, numbers what at saying, you know, they just throw darts at a dartboard. Is, is is rather than going out there and threatening to injure your rather you know fellow fellow combatants out on the ice, he should be taking it internally to the NHLPA and say, right, we need to change what we're lobbying for from player safety. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, either way, I agree. It's, it's Whatever you want to talk about, like the powers that be, whoever decides it, whatever the issue is, it needs to be addressed because Jake Batanen not getting suspensions for that is yeah. is insane. Absolutely insane. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And yeah, Matthew Perot, Matthew Perot should have said, the next time I go up in front of the NHLPA, I'm going to swing my stick at someone's head. <laughs> that's, that's it, Donald <laughs> Fear. You've been warned, mate. Yeah, that'll fix them. That'll learn them. I'm going straight to <laughs> straight to Gary about this one, and I'm going to shove a Bauer Nexus two end pro right up his jacks there. All right, let's get out of here. Last thing, man versus eight year old. Let's do it. Hey, Will, you schmuck! You're going to get roasted by an eight year old, you fool. How am I, how am I looking? You got a, you got a point back. Go so now, now you're down to the cutoff point, which was ten, which is good. Perfect. I'm back back in the back in the very red rather than extremely red. Yeah, it's like D and D. You've now got to roll a life saving throw instead of just being dead. Yeah, yeah so fine. that's that's perfectly acceptable. All right, some peachy games this week. Leafs Flames. <laughs> um, Leafs, because because uh, Mac Chuck is gonna get too cocky and get ejected. <laughs> there you go. Oh God, Jeff. Yeah. Oh God, yeah. Christ, you want if, if he runs over Matthews or Nylander or, or Marner or something? Oh Christ. <sighs> right. Uh, Caps Devils. Uh, Caps Devils. <laughs> Caps. I'm not going to get sucked into this one. <laughs> well, I was hoping you'd pick the. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, Canucks Coyotes. Oh. Oh. Uh, the Canucks, because they have a healthy goaltender. Red Wings Penguins. Penguins. <laughs> <laughs> you never Pen- know. But you, you do never know. And, and I feel now that the Red Wings are probably going to win, but I'll stick with the Penguins. Okay, and uh, Wild Stars. Oh, you fucking bastard. I know you love when I have to print your own team. Yeah, so, so horrible. Horrible. Uh, I'm going to go Stars, because I can't, I can't physically pick the Wild there. That would be heinous. It'd go against your brand. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Will, any last words? Um, no. Maybe next week. Maybe next week. There we go, folks. Take care. We'll talk to you later. Peace.